around the world this Christmas, the Christmas story is going to be read out loud in some form or another. But most of us are going to read it without even asking ourselves where do the words actually come from. You see, 2,000 years ago, a man named Jesus, the Christ, well, he was crucified. And then he rose again on the third day, proving that everything he had said and did was actually true. And this faith, this followers of the way, was off and running. And so people began to ask, what was the whole story behind it? So the writers of the gospel, well, they began to investigate this, to put it down, so they could spread this throughout wherever followers of the way met. So you have to ask yourself, when it came to the Christmas story, the origins of Jesus' birth and how it came to be, well, who's the only person who was there at the beginning and alive at the end for the writers to interview? Well, it, it was Mary. And so in many ways, in w ways we've never really thought of, the Christmas story is Mary's story. She told the writers of the gospel, Luke and Matthew are the ones we get most of the Christmas story from, and it's details, exactly what happened. And so Mary, she begins her story when she was roughly, and this is shocking to some people because we're not living in the first century, nor are we Jewish in the first century. Mary was probably 13, 14 to 15 years old when she begins her story. And it was in the time of her betrothal year. You see, in first century Israel, marriages were generally arranged by parents. They were arranged by parents, but they didn't occur, didn't go further unless the two parties showed interest in each other. So Mary and Joseph were to be wed. And legally, in the betrothal year, she was already his wife, but in that year, they still lived separate. Joseph would go to his father's house where he would be preparing a room, or maybe as a carpenter, he was preparing a whole other home to bring Mary to when that year was over. And, and what's interesting that a lot of people don't know is within that year, Joseph and Mary's father would have been working out the details. Details like how much compensation to give the father because Joseph was taking a breadwinner, a wage earner, away from him. And also because, well, as actually occurred with Joseph, death at a young age was an all too real um, function of living in the first century. And so Joseph and Mary's father were probably working out also a little insurance to be set aside in the case of Joseph's untimely death. So what would she have been thinking? Mary would have been thinking about the wedding that was to come. She had been to plenty in her small town of Nazareth. She might even been the bride's maids. And so what would a wedding look like that she was anticipating? Well, after your betrothal was over, Joseph, well, he would have dressed up in his finest clothes and he would have got his best friends and they would have marched to Mary's father's house where they would have gotten her. She would have been dressed resplendently also. And she would have been, been um, gathered and put on a litter, the thing they carry. And the whole community would form a procession as she was taken to his family's home where the party was to begin. A wedding feast was to last five to seven days. And so young Mary, as she begins her story, was considering and expectant and excited about this wedding. When she would have gotten there in first century Israel, what Mary knew, what she was looking forward to was, her and Joseph would have received a blessing by Joseph's parents. And then she would have been taken away with her bridesmaids to a room to wait the night to prepare, while Joseph and the rest of the community would have begun the party, would have begun to dance and have games and sing. The next morning, the great feast would begin. Joseph and Mary were to come out, again, dressed beautifully in their best garments, and they would have received the blessings of the religious leaders of the time. And then, well, then the wedding happened, the big feast of a wedding, where people were singing and dancing and drinking wine and having a great time. And then that evening, that evening, Joseph and Mary would, for the first time, they would retreat to their own home as husband and wife. But they wouldn't go on a honeymoon. Mary would have been looking forward to the next five days where her and everyone she knew, the family, the friends that she'd grown up with, the faces of those who had encouraged her, that she had actually been a part of, 
for five days, they would have all been a part of her wedding feast as they just celebrated Mary and Joseph. And so if you're out there, you can understand the excitement Mary felt in her, her betrothal year in which she sets the beginning of her story. But Mary would have none of that. You see, she begins her story with an angel, Gabriel, coming to her and saying that she would become pregnant with God's son. And in that moment, I believe, and I think it's true, that she knew that everything was about to change. So she pondered these things, that she was going to become pregnant, because this was not just a normal big deal for us. This was a life changer under any circumstance to become pregnant during the betrothal year. So she goes to visit her elderly friend Elizabeth, who was also pregnant in a miraculous fashion in her older years with a child that is to become John the Baptist. And so she goes and she stays with Elizabeth, who encourages her, who speaks to her. But at some point she has to come home to Nazareth. And so she does. Mary tells the story that when she got home and discloses to Joseph that she was pregnant, his reaction was one we would expect. He was confused, he was hurt, he was angry, and she knew that her fate was in Joseph's hands at this time. You see, if Joseph wanted to make her shame public, well, she could have been killed by her community executed for becoming pregnant during this betrothal period, especially with someone who was not Joseph's child. We don't know how long Joseph debates what he's going to do in his heartache and his anger and his confusion, but we know that he loved Mary because it says that in her words, he decided to put her away quietly and divorce her. You see, they were married. They hadn't had their wedding. And Mary discloses how upon Settling on that fact, at some point, Joseph, in his troubled mood, goes to sleep. But he, in his sleep, has an angel appear in a dream. And this angel tells him that everything that Mary said was true, that she was indeed carrying God's, God's son. So he wakes up, and he takes her in. We know this. But we know that, at this point, the wedding of her dreams could never happen. She would not receive the blessings of religious leaders. She would not receive the celebration of her community as a pregnant woman in her betrothal year. So at some point, as we know, the Romans order a, cen a census, and so everyone has to go back to their home town to register. And so I believe that Joseph took this as an opportunity to get Mary out of Nazareth, this small town with its prying eyes and its waggling tongues, and she, 13 to 15 years old, having to live every day, the subject of some juicy gossip. So he goes to his hometown of Bethlehem, and sometime <coughs> while he's there, she gives birth. She gives birth to a son, and shepherds show up that night. Mary and Joseph give birth to this son, and she lies him, lays him in this, this manger, which would have looked much like a, a stone bassinet. She lays him in there. She swaddles him in cloths, and she lays him in there. And the shepherds arrive to see what the angels had told them had occurred, the birth of a king, the one who would change everything. So... They stay there. They stay in Bethlehem for at least two years. They're there for, for two years. They make a life for themselves. And again, I believe one of the main reasons they stayed there was Joseph was not taking Mary at that time back to Nazareth. They were starting a life. When one day a caravan, and we don't know how large this caravan was, but it pulls up outside their home in Bethlehem. And wise men, again, not knowing how many, we don't know if there were two or if there were 30 or more. We have no idea. But these wise men show up. And, and who were these wise men? They were magi. They were learned men. They were men who had seen a star. And a star 
was a sign of royalty. Anything in the heavens bespoke royal birth, perhaps, and they were well aware of this prophecy that a king would be born to the Jews. And so they begin their long trek from the east to meet this new king, to worship, to pay him homage. But being men of culture and understanding what was required, and also not knowing all the details, they pass through Jerusalem and they ask for a council with the king of Jerusalem, which was King Herod, an evil, evil man, a despicable, immoral, evil, vicious man. And so they tell him what they knew, that there was a star, there was a sign of a royal birth, be speaking of this king that was born. And so they ask him, and what do you know about where we might find this king? And so Herod gathers all of his wise men together, and they say, well, the prophecy says he will be born in Bethlehem. So Herod relays this to the Magi and says, do me a favor. When you get there and you identify which of these infants is this newborn king, please come back so that I may go worship him also. So that is the caravan that shows up in Bethlehem that day in front of Mary and Joseph's home where it says they enter in where Mary was with Jesus and they bring him gifts. They bring him three gifts particularly, but please again, it doesn't mean there were only three wise men. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh they lay at his feet. And at some point they leave. But... God had warned them in a dream to not go tell Herod anything because Herod had different plans than worship. Herod had indeed plans to kill this child. So they make their way back through another route and they don't speak to Herod. Sometime thereafter, Herod, looking for their return with plans to go kill this one child that they identify, he realizes that they're not coming back and so he has Another idea. He decides to send troops to this small town of Bethlehem with the intent on wiping out every male child under the age of two. Sometime between the time when he sends the soldiers out on this horrible task and their arrival... Joseph has another dream where God says in the middle of the night, get up and get out. Go to Egypt. And so he does. There's this sense of haste that Joseph wakes up Mary and they get Jesus and they leave behind almost everything they can't carry is this idea. And they get away and they move away to Egypt. But what follows behind them is, is violence at a scale that is horrific. Because in the middle of the night, The town of Bethlehem is shaken by the sounds of swords and hoofbeats, by the sight and the glimmer of torches. As soldiers make their way through every home, grabbing every child under the age of two, and I'm sure not even checking oftentimes to see if it was a boy or a girl, snatching them out of arms of parents. I'm sure some of them who were killed themselves defending their children and dragging them into the street and slaughtering everyone. I don't know how long goes by. She doesn't tell us, Mary, in her story. But she does reveal that she was in Egypt when the news of the slaughter comes to her. And I want you to consider, again, in Mary's story, what she would have felt. You see, newborn mothers tend to hang out with newborn mothers. They hold each other's children while work is done. They babysit so other things can be accomplished. They talk and tell of stories of he spoke today, he walked today. It was the most beautiful thing. And so Mary, it was not faceless children that she knew had been killed. It was those that she loved. It was not faceless women that she knew were mourning. It was friends. And I want you to consider this very real story that Mary was telling. Real people, real events, and the real emotions that she would have felt. 
knowing that it was because of her and her child that all of this occurred. So, they stay in Egypt until Herod dies. And then, God appears in a dream again to Joseph and says, go back to Nazareth. And with that, as they move back to Nazareth, this first chapter in the Christmas story is complete. A full cycle starting in Nazareth with a young girl who was cheated out of her wedding. A young girl of great faith who understood what the calling was before her, but still had to trust not just in God, but also in Joseph as her fate were in his hands. The story of loss and mourning, disappointment and pain, and makes its way back now with this little family, perhaps even with one or two more in tow, because yes, Jesus had half-brothers and half-sisters, back to Nazareth. So what is my point today with this little story on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, as you watch it? My story is this, and I want you to consider Mary's story, that Jesus entered into the real world. He entered into the real world of disappointment, of pain, one in which these Christmas lights that we have and the songs we sing, well, they shouldn't mask the true world we live in. They shouldn't mask the world that Jesus entered into. You see, what Jesus gave us with his entry into the world on that long ago Christmas day was a promise. A promise of peace, not without, because let's not lie, we look around the world and it screams at us, all is still broken. Around the world, every event I just told you is still occurring. Children dying, women being judged and cast away, kings abusing their power, leaders leading their people astray. Everything is still happening, but Christmas that day, as Jesus entered the real world, Mary's story tells us it's not the present we live in that brings us peace. It's the promise that Jesus brought. So, that's our Christmas story. I hope as you guys look at your lights this year, you realize that most of the people in the towns, wherever you are, they identify more with the pain and the struggle than everything is going well. And Jesus came for them. Jesus came for you. Jesus came for me. That in my darkest moments, as this very real world hurts, the very real promise of Christ gives us peace this day. Merry Christmas.